Hi, welcome to episode 29 of New Tech People. Today we've got Jemima Irvin from NIB, Service Design Lead there. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for inviting me. I think a few people, especially in the design space, know who you are. But for those who don't, give us a quick overview of who you are, what you do. Yeah, so I'm a service design lead at NIB Health Funds. I started off there as a UX designer and I did a Bachelor of Visual Communication Design at the University of Newcastle. I did that pretty recently. I was a late bloomer, you might say, um, getting my act together. And before that, I lived and worked in Sydney as an executive assistant for an aged care organisation. So I had a bit of a midlife career change. Nice. Yeah. Definitely. Definite <laughs> it was change. a big change. <laughs> yeah, cool. And you started uh, on an internship, right? I did, yeah. Uh, so that was organised through the university. I think it was uh, one of the many joys of Newcastle is that it's three degrees of separation. So someone at the university spoke to someone who worked at NIB who put them in touch with the design person at the university and they were like, oh, hey, let's do some internships. So that was Glyn Thomas. Yeah. Um, and Probably the most well-known person in the design space in Newcastle. I would say yes. There might be someone that is more known, but I don't know them, so I'm just going to say yes. Um, yeah, so Glyn Thomas organised these internships for myself and um, Lauren Jones, who's – I'm also a local designer. And, yeah, that was a three-month full-time internship whilst doing uni full-time, so it was really interesting. But it was, it was amazing and it changed my perception of what design was, which I thought was more of a surface-level aesthetic, you know, maybe thinking a little bit about what the market needs but not really actually thinking about the human needs. So that just changed my idea of what design was and from there I just – almost left all the other stuff to one side and pursued the more human-centred design. And, yeah, then got a job at NIB and, yeah, I've been there ever since. So nice. about four years now. Cool. Yeah. And what did spark that move from Sydney to Newcastle and that move from an EA role into design? Yeah, so I'd been working with that organisation for 12 years, which I look back now and I was like, that was a long time. And I'd done a lot of administration work and got into a bit of their like uh, function management and desktop publishing and you know doing the updates on the website because it was like a one-man band kind of thing we had no budget for actual people with skills and we went through a rebrand exercise and I convinced my boss to actually get a design company to do it and not just get me to design a logo and that process, I found it really interesting and I sort of wanted to be on the other side of the table and I just said, yep, okay, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go do a design degree and, yeah. Very nice. And I haven't looked back. Back in the days where uh, logos were done in-house and uh, websites were done well, by the same person that does. I don't think it was. It was not that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was like 20, 2012, wow. 2010, yeah. But it was just we were a charitable organisation, so there was just no interest or budget for anyone to have that job as their own job. We just yeah. sort of split out those sort of things with anyone that was interested. And so I liked that sort of stuff, so I tended to land on my plate. Yeah, nice. And yeah. I think that's been a change over that, that last sort of little period of an appreciation for design as well. Yeah. What's your sort of experiences around, I guess, you know, starting in that UX role and then where you are now and, a change in mindset with people and appreciation for design? Yeah, I definitely think um, the businesses are beginning or have been seeing the value of design over over a long time. I think back in the 90s you had um, Don Norman working with Apple as a user experience designer and, you know, I think we all saw the impact that that made on Apple's popularity because it was almost like they were answering human needs before we even knew that we had them. Um, it was just so intuitive. So I think that being able to put that dollar value to design for companies has made a big impact on these roles being more available for people. And just, yeah, like people like like Lynn just mentoring people and being able to show the value to the business that, hey, if we do this in a way that, you know, we build this website so that people can actually do the thing they're trying to do, they're going to come back and do it again. And that that helps us as a business. And, yeah, I think, what was the question again? <laughs> I, I think it's that, that, that growth in the appreciation for design 
um, where companies are starting to appreciate that yeah. design just isn't about something that looks nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a project I worked on last year which I think is part of the reason why they – I mean, I can't be sure of this, but I think it's part of the reason that the service design role was created at NIB was we worked on a project. We took a service design mentality and took that approach and we made a difference in a problem that they'd been trying to solve for a very long time by taking this, rather than the business being like, we think this is what the problem is, this is how we're going to solve it. We went really customer centric. We used co-design and we did a pilot with 30 customers and we made a massive difference just with those 30 and we thought, okay, there's something in this, this technique, this approach, uh, let's do more of that. So that's, that's I think, why I have a job now as a service design lead at NIV because there was this growing appreciation of those human-centric design processes being applied to business problems. Yeah, cool. Yeah. For those that don't know what you do, yeah. what is a service designer? So I think the high-level version is there's a business problem that I will be given and or find out about and I'll work with stakeholders in the business, I'll work with employees and I'll work with customers to try and unpack why that problem is happening and then work with, again, all of those three groups using various design processes and skills to come up with a solution that actually meets the user's needs or the member's needs that is a better experience for employees as well. Like you don't want to be creating a great experience for your customers but making it worse for your employees. And that's also feasible and viable for the business. Again, you don't want to be creating a great experience that then you're bankrupt within a year. So <laughs> that's kind of that balancing act and it's always really collaborative. Um, you know, I think if I get to the end of a project and it's like, ta-da, here's the solution, that's – and no one's seen it before, That's I've done it really badly. I think yeah. all of those stakeholders, the customers, the members, they need to be part of that all the way along. Um, and, yeah, we do co-design sessions where we can, where we get people to come in, either business people or employees or customers, and get them to help us actually design the solution. So we want to use that expertise that all of those people have as much as possible rather than me just being like, I think this is what the solution is because that's not very human-centric. No, yeah. the human centric is a big part, right? I think that's Huge. a there's a um, there's a rise in roles, not only in your type of role, but a rise in roles that sort of sit in between, you know, humans and technology. And it's mm. about you know what are we building, why are we building it, um, yeah. as opposed to just oh yeah, we think this is a great idea. Our customers will love that, and yeah. really centering it on your customer or those humans. Yeah. And look, it's it's it makes good business sense as well. Like yeah. if you can test something with people before you invest a lot of time, effort and money into building the finished polished product and you discover, like if you do that and you discover no one's using it, yeah. that's a huge waste. Whereas if you can test it early or do research early and even just a paper prototype in front of someone and you can go, okay, well, that was a rubbish idea. Let's let's find a new one. And it just saves you so much in the long run. So I think it's it's so worth it. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Do you think, well, I think bigger companies have already made that move to mm. start to invest in these type of roles. Um, smaller companies obviously probably still in that space where you were at, you know, a few years ago where you multiple people or you're wearing multiple hats. Oh, yeah. Where do you see the future of, of your type of role, just more growth? Yeah, I think as long as there's technology that humans will use, I mean, I think I won't get into like the, the bot revolution, but I think, yeah, when, as long as there's humans using technology, there's going to be that need for people taking a human-centred approach, um, be that designers, you know, with a capital D or, you know, just anyone taking a design approach. I think that's really important. So, I mean, the idealist in me would like to imagine that anyone involved in creating technology will have some human centricity to them. Um, I think that's a bit too idealistic, but it would be great to see. And I've seen this at NIB um, with some of the people I've worked with in DebD. Like they are hugely human centric and they take that approach. And sometimes we'll say things and I'll be like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Um, and so I'm seeing that change already happening with a lot of a lot of people I've worked with. So I think in the future, I think I'd like to see more of that. It doesn't have to necessarily necessarily be someone who's been trained or has a degree in it, but just making sure that whatever we do is embedded in human needs and it's answering a real human problem. Yeah. And if I wanted to be extra idealistic, to look at the impact that has on like broader culture and society and the ecosystem, like 
you know, you make one, you know, that old story about like for the lack of a nail, a war was lost. Like if we do this one thing, it might be good for our business, it might be good for our customers, but what impact does that have on our community or our country or our society? And yeah, I think there's bigger impacts we need to start to be thinking about that yeah. I don't think, I don't see happening enough now. Yeah, maybe a tad idealistic. Yeah. Just a tad. Yeah. Some people are doing it, so I'm like if yeah. more people start to do it. I agree. And it, it, and it is, yeah, it's a momentum thing as well. Once you yeah. know, more people start doing it and getting a further appreciation for it yeah. and see the benefits in it, it will continue to snowball, I think. Yeah, yeah, just looking at a broader system. Nice. Um, you obviously made that career transition. You did that through doing a university degree yeah. at Newcastle. What was your experience with Look, I, I loved it. Um, 100% I, I actually thrived at university, which surprised me because I did university when I first left high school back in the 90s um, and I flunked out twice and I thought, okay, clearly I'm not a university person, so I just went and got a job. But then coming up to Newcastle and doing this degree that I just I just loved it. It was just so challenging and there was amazing lecturing staff and just the opportunity to dive into ideas in a really deep and rich way that – yeah, like I, I came into design thinking I was going to learn how to do type and colour and illustration and then discovering there was just so much more depth to it was great. So um, I have nothing bad to say about my university experience. It was – I'm still involved with um, trying to help people in the design degree get experience. Like I'm working with um, some of the staff now to get – do a workshop at NIB for students, like awesome. design thinking. And so, yeah, I, I try to – help students wherever I can. Give back a little bit. Yeah, give back because like Glenn was so great at getting my career started. I, I want to sort of pay it forward as yeah, much as possible. Because you're involved as a tutor after doing your degree as well, weren't you? For a briefly, while. very yeah. briefly, yeah. So there was a one of one of my teachers actually went on paternity leave yeah. and they were doing a UX component. So um, I got a tap on the shoulder and I was like, yeah, let's let's do this. It was a great experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was just a really short stint, but it was really good. Nice. And the university degree obviously led to the internship, which led to your job yeah, as well. Yeah, lots of opportunities came out of doing university. Yeah. yeah. Do you think um, Do you think it was a different experience having done it later in life as opposed to that straight out of school? Well, for me it definitely was. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, yeah. but for me I, I guess I knew what I wanted and I'd had a lot of experiences in life. Of, you know, like I think when I first left high school, I did not know how to study. I did not know how to be organised. Um, I lived a long way from campus, so travel was a real pain in the neck. So when I moved up here, I was like, okay, I need to live close to campus. These are the things I need to do to make sure I yeah. get my marks. And I just had a goal and I just, yeah, just kept driving towards it all the time. Nice. Sounds yeah. like a really great experience. It was good, yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Was, Have you done any other forms of education? Um. Little bits and pieces, like so I've done courses and workshops, but nothing uh, nothing with a piece of paper attached, I guess. Yeah. But I think that doesn't – I don't really think that matters too much to me um, as long as I'm getting out of it what I need to. So, yeah, I'll go to conferences and if there's a workshop attached that I find interesting or I think will help me with what I want to learn, I'll do that. Um, sometimes I'll see things like meetups in Sydney with the Have a Great Speaker, so I'll – I hate doing it because it's just so inconvenient, but I'll like hike down to Sydney for like on a Thursday night or something ridiculous. Yeah. It's always on the most inconvenient school night and, yeah, go to a meetup just to hear one person speak. And, yeah, so I, I try to do that as much as I can because I think it keeps um, it keeps me fresh in my profession and I'm yeah. pretty – fresh at it yeah yeah like a it's pretty a good commitment and like continual learning right to, to say yeah hey, i'm gonna go to sydney on thursday night i don't think you'd be in a, a very small minority that would do that it's not super regular no. it's like a couple of times a year maybe yeah. <laughs> but yeah is there any is there any outside of the meetups is there any uh courses or online things you found in particular that you'd recommend for people um yeah, so there was one I did which was called Practical Service Design. So that was an online course and it's one that's there's no deadline attached yeah. to it so you can just do it at your own leisure, which was good. Um, I think you do get like a digital piece of paper at the end but I don't think I ever downloaded it. Um, and that had some really good tools and techniques. There's been some, I think, Acumen do courses which are sometimes – connected to IDEO yeah. so that's always good so I have a lot of respect and admiration for the work that IDEO do so anything that I can do that they've had input in I find really beneficial nice yeah and they're all free on 
those ones. The practical service design wasn't free. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And then you've already made mention of a bit of a mentorship you had earlier on coming yeah. out of university. Um, any advice you'd give to people that are a bit younger and, you know, finding a mentor or experience with a mentor? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've got advice that's useful. Um, I think just ask, be, be brave enough to ask and don't be upset if someone says no, because it is a commitment for the person that mentors you as well. So they might not, you know, everyone's got a little bit of imposter syndrome, I find in the design industry. I don't know if it's across all industries, but definitely in design, even some of the people I really respect still have imposter syndrome. So they might not think they're capable or good enough to be a mentor. Um, yeah, so maybe some people will say no, but I think it's always, always important to ask. And even if the person doesn't think they've got much to offer you, you could say, Hey, I don't want the whole shebang. Just maybe just this little bit. I need help with this one thing yeah. and just start off small. Um, but yeah, it's, it is hard in Newcastle. It's, I think one of the challenges is there isn't the breadth and depth in my side of design that there would be in Sydney and Melbourne. So yeah. that is, that. that's sometimes why I do travel because you just don't have those opportunities up here. Yeah, I also think it, it plays part of it. You know, your role is a more newly found role. They didn't yeah. exist you know, five plus years ago. So yeah. there's a, definitely a smaller market of people to tap or ask. Yeah. So it is a, a challenge. Um, it's a challenge of Newcastle. But what yeah. did you bring you to Newcastle from Sydney? Was it the was it degree? Yeah. yeah. So I did the whole like go to a bunch of different university open days yeah. and there was a student ambassador at the university open day for design that was just so passionate and so enthusiastic and um, just knew her stuff and I just thought, okay, if this course is producing people like that, I want to mm -hmm. be part of it. I ended up working with her at NIB, Newcastle, small place. So that yeah. was Yasmin McCall, if anyone knows her. Um, yeah, and she's doing amazing things now in New Access. Of, yeah. yeah. Newcastle is like the university is really powerful for Newcastle in bringing talent to the area mm. and then also educating people in the area. So I think we're really lucky to have a university as good as Newcastle, you mm. know, local. Yeah, it's great. What are you mentioned a couple of little bit little bits there from a challenge perspective with Newcastle? Um, any other challenges you think we face being up here? Is it just you know lack of lack um, of talent pool or lack of breadth? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it, from service design, there's not as far as I'm aware, there's not that many opportunities in Newcastle. So if for whatever reason I wanted to move on from NIB to you know get new experiences or you know work with new people there's I'm not aware of too many places in Newcastle where I'd go so I probably have to go to Sydney and I don't really want to go back to Sydney yeah. at the moment um so that would be difficult yeah. yeah so that would be one challenge and yeah I think definitely the the mentoring the networking um which is one reason why I'm really passionate about IXDA um is is a challenge because there's just not just not as many people and not as much depth yeah. yeah, you mentioned IXDA. We're definitely yeah. going to go there. Excellent. Uh, give us give us an overview for people once again that might not have been there, don't know of it. Uh, give us the, yeah, so the, IXDA, it's um, e, oh, I've got to remember the acronym now. No, I'm not even going to try. You can look it up, Google it, but it's an international organisation and Glyn and Greta started off the Newcastle chapter a few years back. I think Greta had encountered them at an overseas conference and thought, oh, we should have one of these in Newcastle. And I went to a couple of the events they held and it was amazing. So it's it's just all about getting people in this sort of human-centred design interaction part of the industry just together to, you know, share war stories or get a speaker along and just learn and grow together. And I'm a big fan of any type of education. So, yeah, I... I loved that idea of IXTA, um, but it did – It yeah, running a meetup, it's hard. I don't know. There's probably a few people listening that run meetups. And it's 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 tough going. So I think um, there weren't frequent events for IXTA and that made me sad. So that's why I, I put my hand up and said, look, yeah. I've had a little bit of experience doing a meetup because I was involved with the Design Kids Newcastle meetup. Yeah. And so I thought I can help you just at least have regular meetups and then you guys can do anything else you want. I'll just make sure that there's a date in the calendar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Which so, is half the battle, really. Yeah, it is. And that's what I'd learned from TDK, um, that you just you just need to have a regular event and people need to know it's on so they can turn up if, if or when they need to. Yeah, cool. If people are going to turn up, what should they expect? 
Um, so it depends on the uh, the night. So sometimes we try to have a, a bit of a, a rolling schedule, and so we try to get someone. You know, one one month we'll try to get someone who's you know a good speaker. Who maybe like last month we had an amazing person from Sydney come up, um, Karina Smith from Meld, and she talked about design in big organisations and the challenge of getting the value of it across, which was just fantastic, and. We've had people talk on content and accessibility. So we try to do talks that either inspire or inform. And we also just have other other evenings might be quite casual and just more like a networky. So you just we might have some, I don't know, sort of speed networking kind of questions yeah. uh, for people to have chats about. But just it's more like low-key beers and, and food and just conversation. And then we occasionally try to run workshops, yeah. so more hands-on experience so you can sort of do a bit of learning. But you've also got – you know, you can talk to the people in the group and so you're doing that networking on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Us, how many people do we get to a average event? Uh, it depends. So on a night like we had the when we get the big speakers along, like Karina Smith, you know, we probably had oh, – I actually didn't do a head count, but I want to say that it felt like there was about 50 people in the room. Yeah, nice. That's a it great was huge for yeah. us. Um, other nights we might have four because it's, you know, a bad night for people and that's okay. So that might be if we're doing more of a just a networky beer and chats, yeah. as we call them, you might get four or five people along. On average, we're probably hitting like 10 to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that 50 people is a, a massive turnout. For that was we, we plugged that hard because yeah. getting Karina to come up from Sydney, it's just such a big get for, I guess, the design industry yeah. in, in Newcastle. So we were pushing that through the university, through as many networks as we could because we thought she had a lot of things of value to say cool. that we wanted to share. And it's on meetup.com, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, you can find us there. Yeah, which is also on newtechpeople.com. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we did try to help promote those events. So that's great. Um, and it's good to help sort of build that community as well in Newcastle. Yeah. As you said, like I think um, one of the challenges we've got is the, the lack of people, maybe the lack of knowledge around that space. So the more people that get educated on it, the more opportunities it might yeah. arise. Yeah. And educate back to their companies why that we have a need for these type of roles as yeah. well. Yeah. We, we do get a sort of a diversity. It's not just designers that come along. Like yeah. we've had engineers, we've had people from council come along. Um, we've had people in the tech space come along. So it's, a, yeah, if, if what we're talking about is relevant, people will turn up and you get a good sort of cross disciplinary conversation yeah. happening, which is really great. Well, the role really is cross discipline, right? It really is. Uh, it does sit between that technology and, you know, uh, other parts of the business as yeah. well. So it's quite interesting. Nice. Yeah, it's good. Well, hopefully that, you know, continues to grow and grows that space yeah. in Newcastle. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, running a, running a meetup is definitely uh, a challenge. Um, consistency yeah. is a challenge. Yeah. Um, but if, if you're averaging 10 to 12, I think that would probably be very similar to a lot of the other the meetups around i think there's definitely a need for those those niche meetups as mm. well to have you know conversations with other people that are you know facing the same challenges as you. oh absolutely yeah i think that's part of part of the appeal for me is just to be able to sit with like-minded people and be like hey i'm facing this kind of a challenge can't give you the details but you know how would you approach this yeah yeah, yeah hearing other people's war stories knowing other people are going through the same challenges this year it's i don't know why but it's soothing yes yeah i agree I agree. You sound like you're quite a busy person, right? Co co founding or co hosting a meetup, yeah. full time role. How do you how do you manage your day? How do you manage? Is there any productivity tools you use? Is there any anything that you, that yeah. you find really interesting? That so I think probably my new favorite thing is Miro, or it used to be called Real Time Boards, and it's a really great way because a lot of what I try to do is make make problems visual um, so or make solutions visual. So it's, you know, um, looking at current state making journey maps or, you know, if I'm in a meeting with a bunch of stakeholders, almost mapping out the relationships between them all and what they're working on so I can look at it later and be like, okay, that person and that person, I need to talk to them about X um, rather than going through a page of notes. It's all visual. So with Miro, it's... It's cloud-based, so I can share it with people as well, and I can we can be working on it together, you know, f remotely. So that's that's been great because I can just you know flick flick a link to someone and be like, here's here's what I'm imagining this should be, or here's my stakeholder map, and this might help you. So that's been really good um, for collaboration, which is a lot of what I do. Nice. Um, so I love Miro boards. And we'll link that up in the show notes because yeah. that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's it's basically like a big virtual whiteboard 
Yeah. So you, and you can do kind of anything with it. I've seen people use it for um, product maps or, yeah, I use it a lot for journey maps, but, yeah, mind maps and brainstorming and, yeah, it's great. Um, the other thing I use it a lot is Trello. I think that's yeah. probably a well-known tool. Yeah, it's very versatile and, again, you can collaborate. And we use it for, strangely enough, for research. We use it for research documentation and um, so – Back in the back in the day, okay. um, we would put post-it notes on the wall and do affinity mapping, where you're grouping like with like together, yeah. and that's how we do our research analysis. And we, at some point, we were like, "Well, let's try this in Trello," and we started to do the same thing. So it's digitized, and it's just there, and you don't have to worry about having a wall because finding a free wall is like finding gold. Um, and so you can do it digitally, you can do it remotely, um, you can all be sitting at your computers doing it. It's maybe not as much fun, yeah. but it's quite effective. So yeah, Trello has been a really good tool for all sorts of things. But the research analysis was a surprise. The surprise use. Yeah. yeah, saving the rainforest. Eh? I've seen that. Yeah, true, that too. <laughs> those different coloured post-it notes. I've been in one or two of those uh, meetings before. Mm. And all the different coloured post-it notes on the wall. Yeah. Which is, as you said, there sometimes there are some advantages of having people in a room and and doing it together. But yeah, hey, it's not always it's not always applicable. You can't always get everyone no. together. So if there's a, yeah. a way to do that and have people remotely or working together. Yeah, and for some of the research pieces we've done, you would have like you know thousands of post-it notes. Yeah, based on the, how many Trello cards we've had. So yeah, yeah it's it's good. Yeah, and, and somebody has to document that all at the end of the day as well, right? So yeah. Having yeah. all done, done Trello, it's all it's there. It's all in Trello. You're just cutting a step, which is good. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Mm. Anything else you, you use on a daily basis? Oh, just probably some graphic design tools. I use, use, I've used Sketch and I've, I use Illustrator a fair bit more yeah. in my service design role than I did with UX. Yeah. UX, we use Sketch a lot. But um, I think because I'm, I'm probably illustrating more things these days, which is odd i'm using some of my design skills probably more than i used to yeah, right. which was a surprise yeah yeah so yeah design tools to, to i guess to visualize things to share with people and sometimes that's yeah amusing. well that's half the battle sometimes really is like trying to communicate what you're talking about right and if you can if you know through an illustration is a yeah. Easy way to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think trying to communicate. So if we do a research piece of like, here's what the customer is experiencing. So this is the problem we're trying to solve. Being able to communicate that with, um, you know, even just really basic forms of illustration, you can communicate emotion and feelings. And so that creates empathy with the people that you're talking to. And that's, again, half the battle, like to get them to understand the journey that the member's going through and empathize with them. That's really powerful. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that understanding and taking that back and, you know, actually building something with that understanding is significantly easier, right? Yeah. We mentioned ed education, more formal education. Is there any any books you read or have read that you found really impactful? Uh, there was one I read last year. I used to read all the time, I should say, and I don't anymore. It's terrible. Um, but there's one I read last year called, I'm trying to remember it, um, I think it's called Dark Matter and Trojan Horses. And I can't remember the author's name. We'll find it. It's a skinny little book and um, it actually uses the Newcastle, um, I've forgotten the name of it. There was the project to in revigorate the empty spaces in Newcastle. Renew Newcastle? Renew Newcastle, thank you. Yeah, so it uses that as one of the examples in the book, which is fascinating. But it's just talking about trying to get into the spaces within a business um, to make change and doing it sometimes through a Trojan horse. So you do a project but you sneak a bit of like good human-centred design in there. Um, or looking for the dark matter that kind of holds things together and maybe that's where the gold is, where you can start to work and actually affect change. So it was, it was a fascinating little book. That's a nice um, little book, so that will be easy for people. If yeah, I knocked it over in a couple of weekends. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. If you're not reading so much anymore, is there any podcasts you listen to or any audiobooks or anything you've... Yeah, I look, I've been listening to a few audiobooks and I do listen to a lot of podcasts, not a lot of industry specific ones of late. So I've been listening to a lot of, this is going to sound really weird, um, true crime yeah. podcasts, which I know are super popular. And I think one of the reasons I like that is not just for the whole true crime aspect, which I do love, but um, the interview techniques that people use are actually really educational for me. Yeah. So like when I talk to customers and members and employees, like just learning how to ask questions that get val valuable answers. Yeah. Um, and with those true crime podcasts, they do ask really good questions. So that's been really, really interesting um, for me. 
And what else do I have I missing? I, I love that. I think yeah. um, trying to take something that's successful somewhere else and then introduce oh, yeah. that into a, you know, a different field is like, super successful. Like a lot of the things I'll read or listen to is all around like human behavior as opposed to like I'll, I'll not read a recruitment book. Yeah. Um, but if I can understand human behavior and understand, you know, what, people, what people's yeah. motivators are and things like that and psychology a little bit, uh, that's sort of on my edge. Um, yeah. I just I think that helps me become you know better in understanding human beings, um, which I yeah. think makes me better at what I do. It'd yeah. be the same thing there for you, right? Is that how to ask questions, how to you know get more out of people with those interviews? Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, like the human behavior thing. When I like, when I was reading, I was reading like a lot of biographies because yeah. I think yeah, just understanding different viewpoints of the world I find really powerful. Um, What's your favorite biography? Oh, Man, now you're putting me on the spot. It's a while ago. There was one I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was from um, a former U.S. ambassador. Yeah. Um, and I think he was, I think he was an ambassador to Britain, and his his perspective on politics. And this is it's an older book, but it was really, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. I was on a bit, bit of a political bent at that point, and um, I did enjoy his perspective on U.S. politics, and which I did not know that much about at the time, but. Very nice. Um, but, yeah, then I started watching The West Wing and that all changed. <laughs> and that's the other podcast I'm listening to a lot at the moment is The West Wing Weekly. Yeah. And I think, again, it's applying the ways that they do storytelling in film and, and TV and that, and just like they're kind of like unpacking that all on the on the podcast and I didn't even realise, you know, I, I watch an episode and I'm like, oh, that's great. But then they unpack it all in the podcast and I realise all of these little pieces that go into telling a story and part of what I do is storytelling. And so I guess learning like the reverse engineering of a TV show is, is kind of beneficial sometimes, but it's also I just enjoy listening to the podcast. Uh, yeah. This is my pe- favourite part of the interview today. Like, <laughs> I, I, love, I love, love hearing about that and like the things that you, you and I would take for granted watching a, you know, watch a TV show or yeah. somebody's career and, you know, oh, they're just successful. But then if you wind that back, it's like how did they get to there? Yeah. Oh, they went through these ups and downs and these learnings along the way and that's, you know, that's how they become who they are today and, um, mm. no, no different with the TV show, like all the, all the ins and outs, the yeah. intricacies that make that story flow well. Yeah. Um, I, I love sort of being able to sort of take that off and then apply that to, you know, what you do in a day to day. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Is there anyone that you follow, anyone that you think, any blogs, any people on Twitter that you think, hey, I, if I want to grow my career in the design space, you should really follow this person? Yeah, um, so I... I follow a lot of people on Twitter, um, so I'm not going to mention them all. Um, I think one of the things that I, in general, I would suggest that people just follow people that are really different to you, like look for people, and particularly for diversity. I try to fill up my Twitter feed with people that with diverse voices because, you know, I'm a white girl living in Newcastle. I, I have a limited experience of everyone's experiences and I think if I can open my mind up to what other people live, that's really beneficial. And as a designer, I think that's really, really important to recognise that your viewpoint is just a tiny speck in the universe, that there's just so many more voices out there. Um, in terms of specific people, uh, Steve Beatty from Meld, Karina Smith from Meld, I just I find them good people to follow and there's a designer called Christina, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, Woodkey. It's spelt W-O-D-T-K-E. Um, she's a designer. She does a lot, again, with like measuring the value of design. So I find that really important because often I have to say, okay, this is, this is what we want to experiment with or test and how are we going to measure that so we know what impact it has. Uh-huh. And so I find her really really valuable to follow um zoe rose is an australian uxer i like following her um she's got some interesting articles and sarah drummond from the uk she is one of the founders of snook um in terms of service design she often will post blog articles or resources and that's really really great and she's got a good voice for nice. speaking out for the value of design very very nice yeah. cool if you had to provide some advice for an earlier version of yourself, oh. would you say? There's been a bit of a change, right? Yeah, I know it's it's one of those things. I actually have thought about this question previously in my life. Like, you know, what would I tell myself if I could go back to my, you know, high school version of me and be yeah. like, okay, you know, this is what you should do to get ahead. I, but I think if I did anything differently, I wouldn't be sitting here. So yeah. I kind of want to just tell myself, like, 
it's going to work out. Yeah. Um, and maybe pursue the weirdness a little bit more. I think too often I just didn't do things because it was like, oh, I'll look, I'll look weird or, or people yeah. think I'm silly or I'm not qualified to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think sometimes you just got to grab those opportunities. So I think I would have told myself to just be a bit braver and not think that someone else could do it better, but just give it a go. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. And if people want to follow you, catch up with you, yep. reach out to you, what's the what's the best way? Yeah, so um, I can be found on Twitter. Yeah. And you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm not always the best at replying because I don't always check it. And where else can you find me? Um, even on the IXDA meetup is a, is a good place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's probably the best place. That way people can come and have a conversation with you. Yeah, just own. come to IXDA. Yeah. Absolutely. Just come to IXDA. But, yeah, I'm always willing to have a chat about design. Um, if there's any students that want to know more about cracking into the industry, I'm happy to have a chat. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you for your time today. Oh, that's all right. Thank you for awesome. inviting me. Cheers.